My name is Randall Egger. This class is Grammar and Stylistics. It's about writing clearly. Author's authority. In this video lecture, I'm going to be talking about something that I find is really challenging for beginning writers, especially college students. And that's how to take on that persona, that authority of the expert when writing a research paper. Now, I'm going to begin with The Heart of Darkness, the book by Joseph Conrad. And no, this, this isn't a lecture about literature, but I think it does help us to understand how a good research paper is written. So if you haven't already read Heart of Darkness, it, it's got this kind of complex framing of how the narrative is laid out. The beginning sets up this voyage where the narrator is talking about the passengers on the ship. So there's the lawyer, there's the accountant, there's Marlowe, who's an old sea dog, and then there's the director. So these are the, the characters who are on this ship. But very little of the actual action of the novel takes place on this ship. It's mostly just them moving around and playing dominoes or whatever they do on a ship. That the action is primarily told by Marlowe to the other passengers. It, so Marlowe is relating this story of something that happened long ago, presumably. So the way that I view this, so think about the framing that goes on in this. So we've got our first frame with our writer, Joseph Conrad, and then we've got the reader who changes, but in this case is me. Then we've got the frame where the speaker is this unnamed narrator. And the hearer is also unnamed. What I imagine is this narrator, he's an old man who's done lots of sailing in his life, and he's the kind of guy that goes to a bar and just starts talking to whoever will listen. So that's who the narrator is, that's who the speaker is in this first frame. And that then puts the hearer as that bar patron who's willing to listen to some old sailor, right? And so I, as the reader, have to put myself in that position of the contemporary of this old sea dog. And then inside of that is this other narrative, this other frame, where the speaker is Marlowe. And the hearers are the passengers on that ship ride, which includes the speaker, that unnamed narrator is one of those passengers. So you can see how complex that framing is in that novel. And plenty of novels have complex framing, but I like this one because it's so tidy, the way that you've got these three frames. So now from there, I want to move on. So I'm going to think about the framing now for a paper that you would hand in to a class. So a research paper for a class where, again, at that highest level, we've got the writer and that writer, you, are a student. And then we've got the reader who's the professor of the class. All right, now that's at that higher level. But as I've talked about in other videos, imagine the kind of paper that gets written in a situation like that, where the writer is assumed automatically to know less than the reader. That would be a bizarre paper to write. And so to do it well, to do a research paper for a class well, you are forced to indulge in a certain amount of fiction. 
in the same way that Joseph Conrad did, where you have to imagine that you, the writer, are actually an expert. And the reader is not your professor anymore, but a peer. And not a peer of the student. It's not another student. It's a peer of the writer. Doesn't mean that they're an expert. They know less than the writer does. That's got to be assumed. And so in my classes, I always tell students that you have to assume that your reader is intelligent, educated, curious, they want to know about the topic that you're writing on, but they don't know as much as you do, right? They are not versed in this particular topic. That's essential too, because part of your job at that higher level is to convince the professor that you know what you're talking about. And so you have to lay out a situation where you get to explain these ideas to somebody who knows less than you do. But you're not talking down to them. You're not going to treat them as a child. This is somebody who's of the same rank as that expert who's writing it. It just happens that they don't know as much on this topic as the writer does. Okay, now that's essential. And what I want to get at is that we do this automatically in our lives all the time. Navigating these footings is something that we do constantly. Um, Goffman describes it in this way. A change in footing implies a change in the alignment we take up to ourselves and the others present as expressed in the way we manage the production or reception of an utter utterance. So imagine you walk into your classroom and you walk in a little bit early and your professor is setting up. Now at that point, it's not so much a professor-student relationship. At that point, you're just two human beings going about the business of your day. And you may comment on things like the weather and things like that that aren't really appropriate for the classroom. But then class begins and the footing shifts. And now it's the business of the class. But sometimes things happen, like for example, the uh, professor might trip and um, you know, kind of have a pratfall. At that point, footing may change again and a student may say, hey, are you okay? And that's no longer student-professor relationship. That's a, a human being asking about the well-being of another human being. So we navigate these footings constantly throughout our day. And that same thing has to be done when you write papers. You have to figure out what is the footing, what is the persona that you're taking on when you write it. And as I was saying, when you write a paper for a class, you can't take on the persona of a student any longer. You've got to take on that mantle of being an expert. So let me give you an example of a place where I didn't feel a student navigated that very well. So this is a paper that was handed in to me. And the student, towards the beginning of the paper, wrote the following line. Given that the parameters set forth for this assignment are fairly vague, I'll begin by outlining what I intend to cover. Now, what the student has done there is directly referenced the parameters of the assignment that I, as the professor, gave to this student as a student. And they are bringing that up. But my point is, that's not appropriate in this situation. They cannot acknowledge that they're the student, I'm the professor, because then that breaks down the whole artifice of what the article is doing, of treating, you know, of, of this student taking on the mantle of being the authority, of being the expert. And I'm learning from them as this persona that I'm taking on as an interested reader. So let me give you an example of what, where I think a student navigated this very well. So this was another student who wrote, before considering the final approach, singular they, it is important to understand the backlash against generic he. It is now generally believed that generic masculines emphasize males, discriminate against women, and evoke male imagery. Researchers have found that when readers see generic he in a passage, they almost always associate the antecedent of the pronoun with males, and then they go on and cite their source to document that evidence, and so on. So this is a case where the student was taking on that persona as the expert, 
they knew exactly what was right and wrong. They knew the facts. They were going to argue about the facts and draw their own conclusions. And they were guiding the reader, me, as to what was important and what wasn't important in terms of understanding the data, in terms of understanding the facts, in terms of understanding the argument. That's the way to proceed. Now, I know this can be challenging for students because we've been put in this position, you know, from the time that we were children of not being experts. And suddenly we are supposed to take on the mantle of an expert. It's hard. But I do want to assure you that all of us feel this way. Um, I, I remember when I graduated with a PhD, um, I was told that I would feel like a fraud for many, many years, that I would constantly feel like I was pretending to be an expert. Now, in that case, I, I really was an expert, but I still felt like I wasn't. And I still had to put on that persona so we all go through it. We do this constantly in our lives. We take on one persona and then another persona and then another persona. Just accept it, live with it, and revel in your authority.